So you're watching this video if you've got a DPF, a diesel particulate filter. But in this video, we're going to look at ways of cleaning your DPF, particularly if you get that little warning light coming up on the dashboard, indicating that you need to regenerate or re-clean or run a clean cycle on that DPF. So we're going to look at some easy methods of doing this, some general driving habits that can probably avoid you having to go through this process anyway. We're going to look at some of the problem areas that cause those DPFs to, to prematurely fail and die. And we're going to look at methods of actually keeping them in good condition so you can go much further than probably what the manufacturer intended. But always consult with your manual and just make sure that the techniques you're trying is in accordance with your manufacturer's instructions because there are still a few differences out there. And we've seen some videos on YouTube that just recommend driving at really high RPMs, at really full throttle positions. And those situations, they might even cause problems, particularly if your filter is starting to get blocked up. So at the end as well, we're going to mention a warning, really, that a lot of people make a mistake when it comes to choosing additives to add to your diesel in order to clean your DPF. For the certain additives that you should use at certain times, and there are additives that you really want to avoid at certain conditions when your DPF is starting to become blocked and the engine is running its own regeneration cycle on it. So with DPF collecting all of the soot and carbon particles that are coming out of the engine, there are a few different cycles that it will go through to generally clear the soot that it has collected over time. So first of all, we talk about passive regeneration. So this is where you're driving at decent speeds. The engine's exhaust temperatures are sufficiently high to burn off the residue that the DPF has collected over time. And that happens naturally as you drive the car. It doesn't require any special modes. It doesn't alter the performance of the car. You're just naturally reaching this situation with driving the car. So the problem usually comes with lots of short journeys. You're not getting into that passive cycle of regeneration at all. This brings us to the active regeneration cycle where the ECU receives a signal to say that that DPF has become rather clogged and blocked up and it needs to start doing something to clear the soot that has built up in the air filter. So generally it will run the engine hotter. Fuel will be injected quite late in the combustion phase with the hope that that fuel is going down the exhaust stream and it will generate more heat as it passes through the DPF. So different manufacturers got slightly different methods of dealing with this active regeneration cycle. You must leave the active regeneration cycle to run its course. Shutting the engine off before it is finished will generally cause other problems with the car. You'll never clear that DPF fuel. And as soon as you start it up on a cold engine, it's going to be working extra hard to get up to temperature to reach the point where it can then safely go into this active regeneration. So for some drivers, they're in a situation where they never achieve the ideal conditions for this active regeneration to take place. So there's another step that can be taken. Now, this generally requires a specialist mechanic, a little bit of extra knowledge. So you can force a regeneration. So by accessing the ECU through a diagnostic tool. Most garages and mechanics can initiate this regeneration cycle. So how it works and how to get into it varies a lot from car to car in different methods. But generally they will run the car and the engine through this forced regeneration. And the process can take anything from about 20 minutes to 40 minutes. A lot of people actually recommend giving the car a decent run after the forced regeneration is completed and certainly allowing the engine and the car time to cool down from the temperatures it's been generated to burn off all the stuff that is in the DPF field. So you will over time suffer from ash residue inside the DPF. It's been burning off all those carbon, the sooty particles that have been collected. And as they burn off, they will leave that ash residue. So some of that will remain inside the DPF. So eventually that's going to require removal, replacement or professional cleaning. And there's various different methods to actually clean DPFs. And again, that varies from manufacturer to manufacturer. So whenever you look to run a cleaning cycle on your DPF, you must make sure the engine is warm. You certainly don't want to be running the engine inefficiently and pushing a lot of soot through. You want to make sure the DPF is already warm and you're just pushing 
pushing the heat into the DPF in order to get it to burn off those little soot particles. So engine temperature, so most DPF regenerations require a minimum oil temperature and a minimum engine temperature. So the oil temperature often needs to be about 90 to 100 degrees Celsius. There's obviously some variation outside of that, so check the handbook. And the water temperature definitely needs to be up to operating temperature, which so in most cars, the water temperature needs to be at least 75 degrees Celsius, and that will optimally rise to about 90 degrees Celsius. So a prolonged maintained engine speed, sometimes that's as low as 18 miles an hour, sometimes it's as high as 40 miles an hour, but the RPMs is also important, and most will need you to do about 1,500 to 2,500 RPMs, so that involves maybe dropping down a gear driving in a slightly lower gear at the recommended speed. Again, check the handbook for your manufacturer's recommendations on engine speed and speed of the car. It often needs a period of time to complete the cycle, which is generally about 15 to 20 minutes. So if it enters the DPF regeneration cycle, let it finish. You're going to have a host of problems if you keep shutting the engine off while it's in this regeneration cycle. And it's just going to start building up with more and more soot and never really get to the point where it can clear the problem. So that's very much down to driver neglect rather than any particular fault in a DPF system. Even the best designed DPF systems need you to drive for a set period of time at a set RPM to allow enough temperature to get in. So we're talking about exhaust gas temperatures of about 700 degrees centigrade. So some manufacturers set 700 as the minimum, but it's a ballpark. It's going to be varying very slightly depending on manufacturers and the way they've designed their engines and the diesel particulate filter system as well. We're going to talk now about additives. Now, choosing the wrong additive can cause damage to your DPF fuel. So there's two categories of additive that you will put in your fuel to clean your DPF fuel. The first is a DPF cleaner or blockage remover. Now, that's designed not to raise the temperature of the exhaust gases. It attaches itself to the soot particles and allows them to burn off at a lower temperature. So that's generally safe for partially blocked DPFs and for cars that have gone into some sort of regeneration cycle, but you're just struggling to push it through and that regeneration cycle is being forced on you at regular intervals, which might indicate that the DPF fuel is not working optimally or it's not fully clearing after that cycle. So those additives can be very, very useful. The key thing is that they don't raise the temperature because what happens is if your car goes into a regeneration cycle, it will raise the temperature. So you're often talking about temperatures exceeding 700 degrees, which is quite hot. And if you've already raised the temperature with an additive and the car's going into its cycle, cycle and raising the temperature, that can go beyond the design constraints of the DPF itself. And you can actually start to melt the internal components and causes all sorts of problems within the exhaust system and also can damage the engine in some instances. So you just need to be careful. So the other additive is a DPF regenerator or a maintenance additive that can be put into the fuel tank. Now this does raise the exhaust temperature. It's useful to have that in the car all the time just to maintain a nice clean DPF. I say all the time, you don't need it in there all the time, but you need to be regularly using it. So if your DPF regeneration is happening, say once every three months, then maybe once a month, make sure you've got a tank that goes through with this regeneration DPF cleaner in it that will raise those exhaust temperatures. And that's particularly useful if you're doing a lot of short journeys. So that's a good idea to keep your DPF clean, but not a good idea if it's already blocked and you're starting to get problems with the regeneration cycles. So just make sure you understand what you're buying. Read the labels carefully, read the manufacturer's instructions carefully, and be very, very careful. You certainly wouldn't want to end up killing your DPF having to go out and buy a new one for your engine. So please also read your instructions from the manufacturer as to how many RPMs you should be driving and at what speeds, because it's critical to do that correctly for your engine and for your engine's design in order for that regeneration cycle to kick off. So the key to a long DPF life is to make sure the engine is operating at warmer temperatures. It's not producing great amounts of soot and the DPF itself is getting time to 
burn off the bits of soot that have started to collect within it. So avoid driving the engine while it's cold. Avoid those short journeys. Those five and 10 minute journeys really are killing that DPF filter. It's just causing soot to block up. When your engine first starts up, it's not very efficient. It's going to be producing a lot more soot than normal. It's also not going to be warming up that DPF enough to start burning off those particles. You're gonna have a situation where that DPF is just gonna get more and more blocked up. So I hope this video has been useful to you. Other questions people ask you, should I remove the DPF? Because it, it sounds like a real pain. So I've got another video lined up for you that deals with DPF fill and whether they should be removed or not. We also look at other diesel topics. So check out the videos that we've got in our diesel section because it's going to flag up lots of recommendations and tips that you can use to get the most out of your diesel engine. Please subscribe if you haven't done so because we would love you to stay tuned. And thanks for watching. Please boot that like button because it helps us to get out there and I'll see you in the next video. Thank you for watching.